Welcome to the show. Find your balance. 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 Find your balance. That is our goal here at Boost Health. Welcome to episode number 57 of the Boost Health podcast. I'm excited in this episode to have special guest Jacob Schoen on the show. I first heard Jacob on the Ben Greenfield podcast back in 2017. And immediately after listening to that episode, I put my foam rollers and smashing devices in the corner and I didn't touch them for an entire year. And in this episode, we talk about why I did this and why it actually helped me a lot, what Eldoa is, how to create space in a joint, why L5-S1 is still the most important Eldoa exercise, why we should look at our bodies, especially the fascia, as intelligent systems, why creating sliding surfaces may be better than rolling or smashing, when to do Eldoa exercises and how long to hold them, and much more. All right, here is episode 57 of the Boost Health Podcast. Is Eldoa better than foam rolling? With Jacob Schoen. Let's hear a little bit more about Jacob. He's a trainer focusing on physical performance and longevity. He's a lifelong student of the human body, and he's owner of Shift Training and Health in New Orleans. After receiving his bachelor's degree in kinesiology from Louisiana State University in 2014, he began his journey to become the best practitioner possible. Since his graduation, he received a certified strength and conditioning specialist from the NSCA, and additionally, he's a student of the SOMA training program, SOMA therapy program, and ELDOA trainer programs organized by Dr. Guy Voyer. These programs are the most comprehensive programs in training and injury prevention available at over 1,200 hours of required in-person and hands-on learning. He also is enrolled in the DOMP program through the Sutherland Academy of Montreal. At Shift, the motto is move more aware, and this is exactly what he aims to teach his clients. The goal of Shift is to use precise exercise that respects the anatomy and beautiful complexity of the body to create an awareness around movement that impacts the physical health and ability of the client. Additionally, the hope is that this increase in physical awareness affects the mental, emotional, and spiritual aspect of the person's life. Without awareness, it is impossible to create willful and meaningful change. And if the goal is to create a shift in the lives of his clients, then awareness comes first. Jacob hosts group exercise classes at shift to improve both the physical capacity and long-term health of his clients. And additionally, he maintains a practice of entirely private sessions focused on improving the quality of movement and intelligence of his client's body. His dream is that by creating a small shift in an individual, he can create a bigger shift in the overall health of New Orleans. Well, yeah, for sure. Let me just tell you all how excited I am to have Jacob showing on the show today. So I first heard Jacob on Ben Greenfield's podcast, uh, I believe it was in 2017. It was in early 2017. Does that sound right, Jacob? Yeah, it's it's kind of a it's kind of a whir right now. <laughs> to be honest with you, I, I, my my timeline is a little is a little fuzzy, but uh, I think yeah, I think I went to him in 2016, and then we recorded in 2017, something something like that. Okay. Well, I was so inspired after listening to that show that um, I had been struggling with this n- nagging hamstring injury for, it was chronic. I mean, it's probably a couple of years by that point. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you guys had a great show. Um, both of you had some really good points, but I was really inspired by you, what you said specifically um, about how Eldoa can help properly heal the body specifically in the fascia and how we maybe aren't necessarily doing the right things with foam rolling and smashing it to death. (laughs) And, uh, and I think we sort of had a similar background and we, you know, we both gave that a pretty good try Uh, with my hamstring. I would, I would get, you know, the standard foam roller. I'd get the knobby foam roller, the rumble roller. I'd get a lacrosse ball. I'd get even the Olympic bar and smash it to death. And it just never, never got better. (laughs) And I was like, okay, yeah. let's try this whole like not smashing it to death thing and, and try some stretching instead, which we'll get into yeah. what Eldoa is and everything here in a little bit. But I just wanted to say I'm super excited because ever since then, ever since 2017, I've been really excited to to speak to you. And I, I just wanted to say it helped me a ton. I mean, just awesome. leaving that tissue alone to heal properly um, really made just a tremendous difference. So that's why I'm Sweet. so excited, everybody. <laughs> so so cool. you've got your cool. own business. Um it's, it's, it's super cool. It's shift. Uh, and yeah. uh, tell me, 
because you're such a go-getter. Did you open that up pretty much right after you got done with school or how long was it after you, after you finished up? It was uh, in the middle of 2016. I actually did that. So when I left school, I worked at a couple of local gyms as just an independent contractor, uh, just your kind of personal trainer. Uh, I had had, I'd been mulling over in the back of my head. I was like, I know for sure one day I want to own my own business. Even in college, I, I did a, a business minor uh, to, because I just knew I was like, all right, these are things I'm going to need to know if I want to one day own my own business. And so, um, I had to try to switch my mind from kinesiology to accounting back and forth. <laughs> it was, it was, it was tough. That was really tough. But, um, but yeah, so I had known for a long time that it's something I wanted to do, but I just wasn't in the right position. And, and to be frank, like I, I've never really been good at the business thing. I've always been just super passionate about training, super passionate about the body, super passionate about the fundamentals of what I love about this field. Uh, and then just the business thing is what comes second to that. And so it's always been an effect and not really a driver for me. But um, but yeah, so I worked as a independent contractor and I really just wasn't working in an environment that I loved. And I was like, if this is something I want to pursue, then I need to I need to make my own thing. And uh, and so I left the facility that I was at and I was just doing all my clients out of my house, which was not the best situation to be in. But, you know, you kind of you kind of work through it. And and so. I was really walking around the house one day because I was trying to think of the name for a business. You know, I was like, all right, it's going to be, it has to be something that uh, sounds active. It has to be something that is uh, powerful. And, you know, I'm just trying to think of all these words. And, and I really just came up with it because I said to myself, the goal for my business is to help people create a shift in their life. And so whether it be through movement or nutrition or exercise, whatever it is, uh, the goal is to help people create a shift. And, uh, and once I said that word, I was like, all right, that's, that's it, you know? And so that, that kind of stuck. And then um, the logo came after and then all that kind of stuff. But, uh, but yeah, so once I, once I left college, there was always that little bit of underlying tension that said, okay, it, you're going to have to start your business. You know, you're going to have to do it. And, um, and it was only really when I was in a position where I felt like there was no other option than for me to do that, that I really had the impetus to make it happen. And uh, ever since then, it's just been about trying to, uh, no pun intended, but to make shift happen, uh, you know, since then. So it's it's kind of been, you know, it's been three years, I think, since I started it. And um, it's been great. Yeah, it's been great. It's been tough, but it's been good. So, Yeah, I, I think you probably found yourself in a gym, maybe even watching somebody foam rolling one day going, ah, this is just <laughs> not, <laughs> this is just not the environment that I want to be teaching what I want to yeah. teach in, right? Um, so let's get down to the yeah, basics of, totally. of Eldoa. Uh, I know it's a French acronym. Uh, I know it's actually yeah. translated into, uh, I believe it's L O A D S in, in yeah. English. Um, yeah, totally. and I'll let you explain it. I just, I want to say it because I've been <laughs> practicing it. So it's longitudinal osteoarticular decoaptation stretches, right? That's it, man. You got it. You <laughs> right. got it. So now I'll yeah, let you, the, the, the expert actually word. tell us what, what that actually means. Yeah, so it's uh, I remember at my internship, which is how I found out about the Eldoa and this whole program that I dove into after I actually graduated. Uh, one of the guys that was leading the internship dropped that acronym on me. He said it like really fast, and I was like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, whoa what just It's like the biggest word I've ever heard." Um, but yeah, so essentially, what it is is it tries to describe what the techniques do in the acronym. So longitudinal just means head to toe, right? When you work with the when you work with the spine, you're working in an axis, right? So you have longitudinal head to toe, full body. Uh, osteoarticular is a fancy way of saying joint. So two bones, osteo, articulate together, they move together. So that's a joint. And then decoaptation is a word I hadn't heard until this particular program and this way of thinking. But essentially what decoaptation means is to create space. So you're trying to work from head to toe at a joint to create space at the joint. And then you do it in an exercise that involves stretching. Um, the thing is, actually, actually, Dr. Boyer has talked about this and he said in his, if he could go back in time, he would change the acronym a little bit because people confuse it uh, with a stretch. But mm. because it's actually a, what's called a contraction, an extreme range contraction. So the very last actin in the muscle and the very last myosin in the muscle are engaged, which creates the decoaptation at the joint. So it's partly a stretch, but partly a strengthening exercise too. So it works in a couple of different ways. Um, but yeah, so that is a mouthful that tries to explain <laughs> a couple of, <laughs> a couple of exercises. Um, and you have, you have Eldoa for the whole body too. I mean, you can be, 
precise to a specific level of a specific vertebrae, which is Aldoa 5 that we have in uh, about four months, I think, in January. And then, or you could be as global as just, all right, I want to work with the whole dura matter, which goes from, you know, inside the skull and the eyes all the way down to the tailbone. So you can work globally through the whole body, or you can be really specific at a, at a level. So that's what I love about the exercise. You can, you can be, you know, a hammer on everything, or you can be really precise with like a sniper rifle, you know? Right. So I've yeah. heard just, you know, trying to study Eldo as much as I can. I'm, I'm eventually going to go do an actual training because I'm so inspired by it. Um, Good, man. It, it's awesome. It'll open up a whole like, yeah, you'll love it. It'd be great. I, I believe it. I believe it. Just the little bit that I've done has made a, a big difference for me. And just, you know, what you sort of made me aware of is just, I mean, I, I was human biology. I worked on cadavers. I know what's in there. But when when you explained it, on Ben's show, it's like, this is, this is alive below us. Like there's water <laughs> moving back and forth and, and to smash that tissue into smithereens is actually probably not the best idea. It's, you're not creating yeah. good tissue quality. So quick, quick question on, as I've looked at this, I've heard people saying decompression, like you did depressurization mm -hmm. and creating space. Are those all yeah. the same thing? Is that basically what we're trying to do with, with the Eldo stretches is, is those three things. Yeah, for sure. I mean, with with every with every kind of uh, philosophy or way of thinking, there's always different levels, right? So, I mean, mm -hmm. at the very base level, if I wanted to explain it to a client, I would say, you know, uh, your maybe your tissue is dry, you need to drink more water, and then you you have too much pressure on your joints. We just try to take a little bit of the pressure off. Mm -hmm. So that would be one level of thinking about it. And then a deeper level might say, okay, well, to create to create the depressurization, then I actually need to create a chemical change at the level of the spine or at the particular level of the spine that you want to affect to get the water that's in your body to move in the way that I want it to move. Then another level is, you you know, you start to worry about enzymes, you start to worry about electromagnetism, like you start to worry about all these different levels of things. But in reality, your body responds to a couple of things. One is compression and the other is tension. That's how your ligaments work. That's how your organs and glands work. That's how your orthopedic system works in relation to gravity. And so what you try to do with the Aldoa is stimulate the body through tension to create a change in pressure at a specific level. Um, right. If you think of the way I like to think about it is if I am in a classroom, right, and I see a skeleton there, <clears throat> the only thing that's holding up the skeleton is a hook or a rod, right? If the hook or rod goes away, the skeleton falls to the floor. Right. So how, so how is it that I am able to get out of this chair that I'm in and stand up without falling to the ground, Right. I'm able to do that because my body is organized in what's called tensegrity. And so tensegrity is a architectural principle that is transferred into the way that we see the body into biotensegrity. Uh, and what that essentially means is that you have all of these pieces, all right, all of these bones that are held together and pieced together and coordinated through tension, mm. through tension, right? So when I jump up into the air and I land on the ground, why doesn't my heart hit the floor? Right. It's not just because my rib cage gets in the way. It's because I have ligaments that actually support my heart on my sternum, on my diaphragm, on my C spine. OK, so like there's my heart is is uh, is being hoisted by these ligaments. Right. So it's the tension in those ligaments that determines the position of my heart and how well it works. Same thing with your spine. Same thing with your ligaments in your knee. Same thing with, you know, your brain and your skull. It doesn't just sit on the brain. Right. You have a suspensory system of fluid and ligaments that actually hold the brain in a good way. Um, so that level of thinking for the philosophy is important to understand like for the Aldoa and the same reason why it's not necessarily beneficial for the foam rolling and things like that. Yeah, ab absolutely. And, and I'll be at the level one simplified version, <laughs> just trying yeah. to see if I understand it right here. So, you know, yeah. what, you know, if somebody was a Google Aldoa, a lot of times you'll end up seeing, you know, the L5 S1 is one that's pretty common. Um, for sure. That's the, that's like the, the base of the pyramid. If you had to learn, if I gave one exercise to the whole world, it would be L5 S1. Okay. I know even a couple yeah. years ago, that was your sort of your bread and butter. So it sounds like that's stayed the same then. Yeah, for sure. I mean, if I, if I don't know what to do with someone, um, and that's, it, it's pretty often that that happens. I mean, sometimes I get some pretty complex people where I'm just like, okay, I need to spend more time with them. Just go lay against Every, the wall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. As, as, as uh, professional and like, uh, you know, all knowing as I want to seem right now, I, to be honest, like 
there's sometimes I'm like, okay, I'm just going to teach you how to do L5S1 really, really well. And if you can do that, then the more time I spend with you, the more I get to know your body, the more I can figure out exactly the other fine pieces that you need. But always you're going to need to balance out the pelvis. And L5S1 is the best way to do that. It coordinates the whole body and it decompresses the most often compressed space. Right. Um, so if you can do that one well, you can you can usually have a generally pretty healthy lower back regardless of the other levels. So if somebody was to go and Google that, you'll actually see – you know, if somebody's doing it correctly, the the person will have their legs on the wall, flat up against the wall. Their their bottom is against the wall. Their feet are pulling back towards their head. Their feet are turned in. They're raising their yeah. arms up and behind their head. Their chin is tucking in. There's a lot of cues going on, and it doesn't look sure. like a typical, even a stretch. Really, it's it's really sort of unique looking. Um, but what you're basically trying to do, if I if I understand it correctly, is I'm trying to pull the fascia out from the top of my head to my fingertips, which are, would be above my head all the way down through my toes. Right. And on that one in particular, what you all are trying to do is trying to pull upward from, I guess it would be L five up and mm-hmm. pull yep. downward from S one down. And that pulling in two different directions is actually what's creating that depressurization or, or creation of space. Right. Yeah. hundred percent. You have the, you have the image. Perfect. Yeah. That makes that's exactly what it is. And, and what you're trying to do is, is exactly that because, because the, because the spine is essentially floating in your body right now, right? Like you have no hook, you have no rod. If I pull on one end, then the whole thing moves. Oh yeah. Right? Yeah. You see what I'm saying? So if I, so it's kind of like, um, if you imagine walking a dog, right? If you imagine walking a dog, if your leash is a hundred yards long, well then the dog's going to have to be a hundred yards away for you to have control of it. Right? right. Because that's when the leash actually has tension. So what you're essentially trying to do is you have L5, you have one dog, you have S1, you have the other dog, is to create tension in the leash so that you can move the dogs how you please. And to create the space, then you need to move one away from the other. Or in this, in, in, in the case of L5-S1, you really want to try to keep S1 totally still, which is why you push the pelvis into the wall and you try to move L5 away from it. Okay, right? yeah. So you try, to, you try to create a fixed point with S1 and then move L5 away. But in your mind, you're saying go away from each other It is basically what you're trying to do. Yeah. And I've heard you say that with the, with these aldoas, we're, we're affecting the ligaments. We're affecting the tendons, which you would sort of expect, but it's also the nerves and your vessels. Yeah. And this one surprised me too, the fascia, obviously, but the autonomic nervous system. So could you, could you elaborate on that? Like, I know the autonomic nervous system, it's, it controls our breathing, our heart rate, et cetera. But so how, yeah. could, how could aldoa affect that system? Yeah, for sure. So if you look at just the very basic level, the thing, one of the things I love so much about this program is that it's not, um, there is some philosophical theory that's involved, which is kind of like any, any methodology. Um, but it's, my teacher always says it's not the Guy Boyer methodology. He has his foundations in anatomy, biomechanics, histology, uh, microbiology, all the things that you can really point to and say, okay, you can list, uh, defensible reasons why that might be true. Um, and the thing that I love about part of the explanation for the autonomic nervous system is you just look at the anatomy. So the sympathetic chain ganglion, which is essentially your kind of central hubs for your autonomic nervous system, sit on the very front of the spine. And they don't mm. sit there because they're glued there. They sit there because they're connected to the periosteum through the fascia. So if you affect the spine in a positive way or a negative way, you can affect the autonomic nervous system. But if you affect the, affect the spine in a positive way through the fascia, then you directly affect the autonomic nervous system. The other thing is, is to be able to properly get into a position where you are breathing and you have enough tension to change the spine, then the parasympathetic nervous system has to down or has to upregulate a little bit and the sympathetic has to calm down. Otherwise, you'll be so tight and so tense that you won't affect it. So it affects it in both a passive passive and an active way. Um, The other thing is, it's like, okay, you uh, you have the nerves, they're invested directly in fascia. You know, they don't just float there next to the muscle. They have the epineurium, they have the perineurium, they have their layers of fascia that actually um, affect, affect the way the nerves move through the muscle and move through the body, through the spine, through the canals. So once you affect the spine, you can affect all and you have to bring all into tension to affect the spine. So it's kind of a, a give and take, a back and forth um, kind of thing. But particularly, yeah, particularly for the autonomic nervous system, they sit right on the front of the spine. You know, so if you affect the spine, you affect them just by uh, 
by association. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That makes total sense. And I mean, I don't think you probably have too many people that get out of holding L5 S1 for 60 seconds and say, oh, I just feel worse than I just started with. <laughs> you usually yeah. feel a lot better. It's a, it's very, uh, yeah. I guess you could say it's very parasympathetic inducing. Yeah, I, yeah, absolutely. It, it is interesting though. Like, uh, so I teach uh, group classes. I teach one on Monday and one on Thursday and th they have different purposes. And But every class finishes with some LDOA just because, um, for example, if you train the abs and the glutes and you, and you contract the abs a lot, well, then you need to start to decompress the spine and stretch some of the muscles after because mm -hmm. you have to move the spine to train the abs, you know? So, um, but yeah, the thing is, is that you have a lot of people, especially I think in our culture that are so stressed out and so tight, either from emotional responses to, to life and to work, or just from working out all the time and never stretching that they finish an elbow exercise and it's like they just ran, you know, a hundred yard sprint or something like that. They, their face is all red, they're sweating. They're like, ah, ah, ah. but the reality is the goal, I, the goal, the way I see it at least is to be able to work as hard as possible without working. Because the more that you, the more effort that you put in, then a lot of times the more the muscles contract and the more the muscles contract, the more you actually close the space for the joint and you don't allow freedom. Oh, right. Right. You know, sense. so you want to be it. So that's why the breathing is so important. So you, if you do it well, you actually get into a place where it's partly meditative, partly, uh, partly just really connected to your body, but also you are working very hard. So it's like this interesting balance between full effort and almost no effort. If that makes, does that make sense? It it's does. A little bit yeah. Of, yeah. Well, maybe that's a good tie into my next question because I've, I've, I've heard you say that you can't create space around a joint if the tissue's too tight there. So yeah. what do you do in that situation? How, how do you work around it? Is, you know, if you've got somebody that's super, super tight in their hamstrings, for example, they may not be sure. able to properly get into L5 S1. Yeah, totally. So, I mean, uh, like a classic example would be something like that. Everyone gets up on the wall and they try to straighten their legs a little bit and their butt <laughs> lifts off the ground six inches or <laughs> right. their, their feet, you know, points. And that's a classic, classic thing. So that is where going to see someone who is, is, is trained in how to progress and regress the exercise is going to be really important because um, the Aldoa by themselves are incredible, incredible exercises. But if you actually take a step back, it's two classes in a 16 class, 16 seminar, 16 class curriculum over the course of three years in the SOMA training program. Wow. So as amazing, amazing, amazing as those tools are, they're inside of a bigger picture that needs context, right? So, um, for example, though, if you if your hamstrings were so tight, then maybe your program would be L five S one. You would do some myofascial stretching for whichever hamstring it is that's the most tight for you. Maybe myofascial stretching for a piece of your gastroc, so you could do L five S one better. Maybe you need to stretch the lat because your arms won't go over your head. Maybe you need to work on the C spine because you, you you're stuck in extension. Any of those things can make your L five S one more effective. But in a, a simpler answer is everyone just works to their maximum. Mm. Everyone works to their maximum. So if your maximum is like, let's say you have a lady who is, you know, super flexible because she's a, been a yogi for all her life and maybe she's never trained with weights or ever gotten really tight. She's very relaxed. Um, her L5S1 might look totally different than my L5S1 because if I'm really tight and can't touch the floor with my hands, then, you know, it's going to be difficult for me to straighten my legs and look like the textbook, you know? Right. So Everyone's is going to be a little bit different, but the, the, the idea is you want to stimulate the body to change and to create change. You need a, a field of demand. So to create a demand, you need to have the person work to their maximum. So if their maximum is their knees are still bent by 20 degrees, then that's their maximum. And then they try to work a little bit better each time, you know, each time. Gotcha. So like, I mean, for example, I have people in, in class that are either weightlifters or they've been stuck at a desk for, you know, 20 years that whenever they do T six, which is just a classic one over your head like that, their spine is, it looks like the letter C mm. it's like totally, totally kyphotic, totally rounded. They're fighting. Oh, they're doing this. But I would rather that than someone who has been doing yoga for their whole life and just holds T six without even looking like they're trying because for oh. them, no demand being created. Right. So there's the balance between looking orthopedically like you want the textbook to look and then actually being challenging enough to stimulate the person to respond to the exercise. 
Yeah, that makes sense. And you said, so myofascial stretching. So let's say you've got the guy that's got cables for hamstrings and they just, they won't unlock. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. So you would maybe do some primers or some myofascial primering before he would get into L5S1. And I heard you say, this is really cool. I'm going to, I'm going to pick your brain in a little bit on this. Um, that yeah, there, sure. there would be some specific things, maybe even just for the hamstrings to try to open those up a little bit, right? Yeah, totally. So, I mean, if um, a, a lot of times people that come in that are really super tight. So classic example is, you know, the guy who played high school football, maybe he played college football, then he was, you know, now he's a competitive golfer. He likes to lift weights, likes to work out, but he hates to stretch. Mm -hmm. I see, I see those guys. <laughs> I see those guys every day. Um, and uh, I love them. I love them. But it, it's, it's, it's funny to work with them. So a guy like that, I might do, let's say I wanted to get hit, let's say the main goal of the session was to get his L5 as good as it could possibly be. Well, he needs to have good flexibility in his biceps femoris because of the, the position of the hamstring, you need internal rotation. So the biceps femoris, the lateral part of his gastroc, probably the psoas because the psoas attaches to T12 all the way down to L5. So if I want the L5 S1 to be free, I need to stretch the psoas, probably has tight hips. So I need to do maybe some of the adductors. All of those things go into a bigger picture. And then maybe at the end of the session, the final culmination of all that is the best L5 he's done. But his home program, which is a big part of the way that I work, is uh, his home program, if he has 15 minutes, might be specifically biceps femoris, myofascial stretch, and then you know maybe a general LDOA, and then L5S1 or something like that. You know, It might be something like that because if he has lower back pain and I know for sure he needs to be able to do L5, then there's a progression to be able to get him there. Uh, but a lot of these people, sorry, I kind of skipped a step, are so tight that they can't even really stretch. Does hmm. that make sense? Like they're so, they're so in their own way about how tight they are and how much effort they have to put in that they're not even really stretching yet. So a lot of these people I'll have do the segmental training, which is the first year of the SOMA training. I'll have him do a lot of specific segmental training for the parts of the muscle that I need to eventually stretch. One, to get blood flow there. And two, if you, if you uh, exercise it in a particular range, you don't actually shorten the muscle. You can actually increase the length of the muscle in relation to the tendon. So it's not stretching necessarily, but maybe it's a step that this person needs before they can do the stretch, before they can do the aldoa, right? So there's a, there's a progression that, that goes on, but um, that's the fun part. That's the puzzle. Mm -hmm. And that's also, that's also in some way the negative part of seeing an exercise online uh, because you don't realize like there is a big, maybe there's, maybe there's six weeks of work before someone even comes close to looking like the, the video online. You right. Know what I mean? So, um, it's, I'm glad the exercises are out there because they help people. And so that's, I think that's awesome, but it's also an interesting kind of dilemma because then you have, um, the idea of what the exercise should look like. And then you have every individual that needs to, uh, to accommodate what they, what they have in their own body. Yeah, I think that's one of the great things about Aldoa. Like if you have even just a little bit of appreciation for biomechanics and mm -hmm. the kinetic chain, then you can appreciate that Aldoa goes into extreme detail on understanding that. <laughs> and you're not just going to have somebody go over and stand in front of the mirror and do some biceps curls. I mean, it's it's really, yeah. really very complicated stuff. And I can see why you could maybe even get a little squeamish when you have somebody just pop a Aldoa movement online, throw it up on YouTube. And then just, you know, there's a lot of things that <laughs> yeah. can go wrong there. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, I think it's, yeah, I think it's both good and bad. I think it's, I think it has good things and bad things about it because to be fair, if I had, if I looked back at the way that I was teaching Aldoa exercises after I took the first Aldoa one in 2015, I would probably laugh at myself and be like, that's <laughs> not the way that you teach that the foot's supposed to do, do like, the reality is everyone's at a different stage in the way that they learn, the way that they teach exercise, the way that they actually work with their people. And so I don't, uh, I try not to be one of those people who's like, oh, it's not the way that I do it. That's wrong. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. it's not wrong. It's just the way that you're current. It's just where you're at right now. And so as much as I think it's sometimes a bad thing because maybe someone does it the wrong way and doesn't get a good effect from it, maybe there's 20 people that do it that way and feel better after. So good point. Yeah. Kind of a give, yeah. It's kind of, it's kind of give and take with that. You know, I want everyone to do as good as possible, but the reality is, is that, you know, uh, everyone's at a different level. So it, it just works in different ways. Right. All right. Let's talk about 
what was so inspirational to me when I heard your show a couple of years ago. So it's foam rolling and smashing. <laughs> and as I, does that just sound good for you? Just smashing, just smash it, smash the tissue to death because, well, that's part of what the problem is, right? Like at least in the States, yeah. it's like no pain, no gain. And, and in this particular case, it, it could actually be causing more problems. So I think I told yeah. you, you know, I did this N equals one experiment after I listened to that. I was like, all right, that, seriously, the next day after I listened to you talk, I, I put my foam rollers in the corner and I didn't touch them for a year. I was really proud of that. And I wrote nice. an article a year later called uh, three reasons to not foam roll. <laughs> okay. <That's a> solid. <laughs> but you know, the, the problem was I had this hamstring injury that wouldn't heal. And sure enough, as almost as soon as I stopped, you know, beating the tissue into oblivion, it started to feel better, which makes sense to me now. And, yeah. you know, I think one of the reasons this happened, which I think you would agree with is that we're not least uh, most of us are not licensed massage therapists, so we can't really appreciate which direction the fibers are going. And we don't really know yeah. if we're pooling blood, if we're pushing in the right direction or the wrong direction, maybe we're, which I want you to talk about whether we're maybe even pushing yes. water through the, the tubes in our, uh, fascia, the wrong direction and, and maybe even yeah. dehydrating our tissue more. So can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, what's going on underneath our skin? Why, why may it not be such a great idea to, to try to, you know, fix adhesions and fix, fix trigger points with, with this type of method? Yeah. Yeah, sure. That's a, <laughs> uh, this is, this is where I have to organize my thoughts so I can stay, stay totally on track. Um, but first, first it, it is partly a philosophical thing. Like it is in some way you have to accept that you're going to look at the body a certain way. Uh, if you look at the body as just uh, a random organization of bits and pieces and, you know, all right, it's pretty cool. It looks kind of good. It does some stuff, but there's no real intelligence in it. Then it maybe makes some sense to smash it or to, you know, gnaw on it or whatever it is you want to do. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> have an adhesion, just, know, just bite it. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, if, if but if you look at the body the way that I've been in not instructed to look at it, but the way my eyes have been opened up to look at it, it's just this amazingly beautiful, complex, organized, continuous, just unbelievably intelligent thing. It really is just unbelievably intelligent. Um, and the fascia is really what gives your body its intelligence. The reason why the fascia gives your body its intelligence is because for your body to be intelligent, one, it needs to know its place in space. Okay? Mm -hmm. and, your, and your fascia is what actually gives the feedback to your brain about where you are in space. So you have the periosteum, for example, has the fastest type of neurons that send the information to your brain. So it's not in the bone. It's in the periosteum, which is a fascia. Right. So that has it. Then you also have the ligaments. So how do you know whenever you're walking that you're about to sprain your ankle before you roll your foot? Well, it's the ligaments in your foot that give you the feedback to allow yourself to catch. It's not the muscle. It's the ligaments. And then even if it were the muscle, it'd be the smart part of the muscle, which is the tendon and the fascia around it. The muscle is just meat. It really is just protein and water. So from that level, you have to say, okay, there is something that's intelligent about my body that allows me to move and do the complex things, gymnastics and soccer and all the stuff that we can do. So what is it that allows the intelligence of the fascia? Okay. Now the fascia is simple and it's complex. It has different types of fibers. But basically what the fascia is, is it's tubes full of water. Hmm. Okay. So when you have a tube and you have something in it, that thing is supposed to move. The water, it doesn't just sit there. The water is supposed to move. Which direction is it supposed to move? It's supposed to move in the direction of the tube, right? So you have different pieces of fascia throughout your body that go head to toe or left to right or over, you know, over different bones. They have their directions. Um, if you try to push the water in a direction that the tube is not going, you don't create good movement in the water, right? right? So life is movement. Your body is 70% water. So 70% of your life is the movement of the water inside of your body. So how healthy your fascia is, how well it moves, how well the water moves inside of those tubes is going to be a big determining factor on how healthy you are. If there's no movement, just like if there's no movement in a pond and the water gets stale, well, then you have the chance to grow algae and disease or in the body, you have the chance for injury, you have the chance for cancer, you have the chance for any number of ailments that could be uh, organized and starting in the fascia. So the thing is, the problem is, is that things get really tight because of our posture and our lifestyle and things like that. And so maybe dehydration, maybe nutrition. So people say, oh, this is tight. 
Well, it, it doesn't move. It's scarred. Well, then I need to break it up. Okay, I need to break it up. All right, it was scarred. It's all well, it's all it. So I mean, just uh, just go in there and just break it up. Problem is, is that it didn't become scarred for for no reason. It became scarred because of lack of movement, or because of injury, or because of any number of factors. So if you say, okay, maybe I strained a muscle or strained a ligament, and then to heal itself, it's scarred a little bit. So if I wanted to unscar, then I need to break it up some more. Okay, if you look at it from a mechanical way, maybe that makes sense. But if you look at it from the fact that an injury caused it to scar in the first place, re-injuring it by just putting a whole bunch of pressure through it is not going to get it to reorganize in the way that you want it. Just breaking it up doesn't really make any sense. One, if you look at it from a microscopic level, which is these are beautiful, I mean really beautiful, like small, clear tubes of water that are, are delicate if you really look at them. Yes, they're amazing, resilient, and strong, but they're not, uh, they're not iron. Even, hmm. if, even if they're scarred, even if they're scarred, they're just a different organization of the same material. So if you want to go in there and just break it up, you're going to create the same problem that you were trying to fix in the first place. Sure, if I have a rope that has a knot in it and I cut the rope, well, yeah, the knot doesn't matter anymore. But right. when I want the rope to heal, guess what? It's going to make another knot, and then I have to cut it again, and then it just reorganizes in a bad way. So this is the same reason why people have to do the do the grasting in the same spot every week, or do the foam rolling in the same spot every week, or do you know whatever it is that they do now for these manual stimulation techniques in the same spot all the time. It's because you're not actually one respecting the direction of the fibers of the fascia, so you're not getting the water to move in a good way, and two, you're viewing the body as this robotic mechanical <laughs> thing, which says if I beat this thing, then it's going to listen to me. Your body has been here. It's way more intelligent than you are, right? So if you use techniques, whether it be manual techniques or exercise, to try to stimulate it in a good way to just organize the way you want it as opposed to just going, oh, I don't like you. Get out of here. You know? <laughs> it's just if, if you really take a step back, it's so, it's so unbelievably to me just barbaric and kind of crude in, in a lot of ways. You know, I mean, it's like um, – it's it's just bullying. It's just essentially trying to bully your body into doing what you want it to do instead of saying, "Oh, okay, I respect I respect the intelligence of my body. Let me see if I can treat it in an intelligent way." And yeah. that's kind of the difference. Yeah. That's the the ph philosophical thing I was talking about at the beginning, which is just you have to see the body a certain way to respect the idea that putting oh I don't know if you're a 200 pound guy and putting a lacrosse ball inside of your piriformis maybe that's not the best idea. Because now you're putting 150 pounds of pressure through four square centimeters in an area that has arteries, nerves, veins. And the other thing is, sorry to go on a tangent here, but no, I want to go on a tangent. Pain. People need yeah. to hear this, dude. This is this is yeah. really important. It is because your body has layers. Okay, it's not just my skin and then everything else. <laughs> it has layers. Like if I peel back a layer, well, guess what? There's more stuff underneath it. I just keep peeling back layers until I get to the bone. So part of the role of the fascia is to create a sliding between layers so that when I turn my torso for a golf swing, I don't pull on my liver. I don't pull on my diaphragm. I don't pull on my heart because if I had to do that 20,000 times every time I play golf or walk, guess what? My liver, my diaphragm, my large colon, my heart, they're going to get pretty upset at me. Mm -hmm. So part of the job of the fascia is to create a sliding between the structures in your body. Okay. If I want to create a sliding between structures in my body, what does that mean? I mean, I need good quality tissue so they can slide and not dry and, and nasty. And two, I don't want them to be stuck together. So if I don't want things to be stuck together, guess what I don't want to do? I don't want to compress them as much as I possibly can through four square centimeters on a lacrosse ball with 80% of my body weight. Right. It doesn't make any, it doesn't make any sense to me. The other thing is, is that most people, they don't know their left hand from their left foot. So how do they know if the pain that they have in the muscle from the lacrosse ball is a good thing? Or they're just putting a lot of pressure on a nerve. Right. Yeah. And neither, and to be fair, neither do most manual practitioners. Like a lot of them, they say, okay, ooh, my client says this hurts. That must mean I'm in a good spot. <laughs> no, yeah. not necessarily. Right. Not necessarily. I mean, I can find, I can push on your nerve in your, I can push on your static nerve underneath your piriformis in four seconds if I have you on the table. But it doesn't mean that that pain is a, is a gain. You know what right. I mean? You have to. You, you have to just evolve the, the thinking of the way we treat the body has to evolve a little bit. Yeah. I really like how you explain that with the sliding surfaces that really, that turned on a light bulb for me with, we're not just uh, meat underneath of our skin, right? Like, <laughs> so you explained it once where let's say you have an adhesion 
and that yeah. adhesion is stuck between those two sliding surfaces, right? And sure. so I really like how you described it because we want to create a sliding surface and, we, and it's stuck there because of that adhesion. And so like right. you just said, a typical way to attack that would be with massage or with smashing or something. And so instead of creating that nice, smooth sliding surface among those two layers, all you're really doing is just squeezing it even more together. And I think yeah. honestly, like Aldo is fantastic, but one of the biggest reasons I had progress so quickly when I stopped was because I stopped. I just left the tissue alone yeah. and let it, um, you know, because tissue quality is one thing you talk about a lot too. It's like, it's just, it, you're creating scar tissue on top of scar tissue on top of scar tissue. The quality of that tissue can't be good when it's trying to heal back together, right? 100%. Yeah, I mean, 100%. As scar tissue is... Um it is, it's tissue that just hasn't gotten any love in a while. Right. <laughs> and so if you just, if you just, if you just essentially go with the attitude that, Oh, I hate you get out of my body. Then <laughs> all, all you're really going to do is stimulate more of the same thing, you know? So one, you have to make sure that obviously the big factors diet and lifestyle are in order. You're drinking good water. Uh, the stress is as low as can reasonably be in 2019, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and then, and then you have to say, okay, is the, is the exercise that I'm doing intelligent and is the therapy that I'm getting done intelligent? Because apparently, and this is something Dr. Boyer has said in, in his, his classes. So um, there's three years of the soma therapy. So there's a soma training, which is, you can think just exercise basically and the soma therapy, which is just manual practitioner work. Um, the second year is fascial normalization, which is what I would use to, uh, to work on some of the scar tissue that you were talking about which is essentially trying to reorganize the gliding of the layers, the movement of each piece of fascia in relation to what might be, what might be scarred. Uh, and apparently if you try to move the water in the tubes in a way that is more than 10 degrees off of the direction of the fiber. So if I don't know my anatomy really, really well, then not only can I create harm by too much pressure, but I could also create harm by going in the wrong direction for the piece of tissue that I'm trying to work on. Wow. Because if you think about it, the water wants to move in the tube. If you try to push the water against the side of the tube or in a, in a, in a way that isn't um, conducive to the way it naturally works, then it's, I think it's really easy to see how you can end up creating more trauma and more problems with the way that it works in the long run than if you were to, in your case, just kind of do nothing. So I don't want to throw massage therapists under the bus because there's obviously really good ones that probably know their anatomy, no problem and, and push in the right direction for blood pooling and sure, sure, sure. tissue quality and all that stuff. But I, I'm just curious, do you need, do you need to get any body work done yourself? And yeah. is it something that you recommend for other people? Just regular old yeah. massage therapy? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I do. I do. I, I, I view massage therapy as a really, really valuable tool in the toolbox because a lot of times people have, uh, for example, if you look, if you look at the leg, right, let's say I just, weirdly enough, let's say I just chopped my leg off, right? And now I'm holding it like a drumstick. I'm looking down at the bone, looking down towards my foot. Well, wrapped around my whole thigh, all right, are all the muscles of my thigh. In between those muscles should be some septums. There should be different pieces of fascia that kind of separate the leg into its different compartments, adductors, uh, extensors, flexors, all of that. Part of the goal, I think, of massage therapy is to get those pieces to move amongst each other. Hmm. It's not to put a whole bunch of pressure through. It's to say, okay, is my, I'm going to have to use some anatomical words, but is my rectus femoris separate from my psoas? Is my adductor magnus separate from my adductor brevis, separate from my pectineus? Do those move? Can those move separately? If they can, great. If they can't, then part of the job of the massage therapist is to get them to move better. And that is really valuable because then they move better. And then if you go to a trainer that knows, knows what they're doing, then they can stretch in a good way. Because if you just have all these things tied together and you try to stretch uh, maybe they all maybe they all pull and the one that you want to stretch doesn't move as well. So the therapy and the training go hand in hand. Like they are they're on the same team going for the same goal, but they have different approaches to, you know, what would be effective for that. Okay. So sure, yeah, I, I get um I don't get a massage as often as I should because of well, different reasons, but um but no, I totally believe in it. Whenever I go to um whenever I go to Dallas uh, for classes or Montreal for classes, I try to book a session with uh, an osteo so that they can work. I have a hip problem that I've been working on for 
freaking forever. Not hard, not hard enough, but, uh, <laughs> cause I like to work out, but, um, but yeah, so no, I get, I get manual therapy done as much as I reasonably can because it just does things that exercise to be fair Frank sometimes just can't accomplish. Sometimes you just need someone to go in there, reorganize the tissue so that the exercise becomes more effective. Okay. I'm surprised by that. I'm, and I'm glad to hear that. So we're not, we're not saying Pasha to all, <laughs> to all physical therapists and massage therapists. Do you ever yell no, at them that they're going not. in the wrong direction? Say, no, bro, that's not the direction <laughs> of the, <laughs> you're five degrees off. Man, uh, uh, no, I try. I try to just, I just enjoy it. Like most of them, if I ever get a massage, most of the time it's, um, it's just for me to, it's just for me to relax. It's just, I want someone to kind of move my body around and I want to be totally passive. But the thing after the thing I always do after I get a massage is I make sure I book time so that I can stretch after. So right. if I'm getting an hour massage, I'll save and I'll book it for two hours. And then I'll just use the second hour just for myself to just stretch what is now more free, has more blood, has more, um, more of my awareness in it as well. Cool. So I try to use it for both. Yeah. All right. Something else we have in common is, is a hip issue. And I'm, I just want to pick your brain a little bit about how you've used Eldoa to, to help with it. Um, mine is, I think probably from repetitive use in cycling and running. I think yours maybe was even possibly the same thing. Cause I know you did a little yeah. bit of that yourself. Um, you know, I've, if I, if I do a squat or if I try to kneel on my knees and I sink down, you can visibly yeah. see that my left side is higher than my right. I've got some wacky stuff happening in there and I've, I've tried yeah. all the stuff that I shouldn't have and everything that I think should help. And I just, I can't seem to get it anywhere. I have not yet um, learned or tried any specific Eldoas that are for like the hip flexor or, or um, like the IT area. So I'm just interested yeah. to hear what you've done and if you've seen any progress. Yeah, for sure. Um, you, based off of what you just said, you might have a problem with like uh, two things I would look at right away are your internal rotation one side to the other. My guess is you probably have a much tighter obturator internus and piriformis on the side that won't sit as low um, and probably some stuff with like the proximal uh, part of your hip in the very front. Like if you bring your knee up in deflection, do you have uh, do you have like pinching in front of your hip? Uh, no. Um, okay. but good. when I try to kneel down on, like when you're trying to kneel onto your heels with your yeah. butt to your heels, my, my left it band, I feel like I just want to chop it out of my body. <laughs> <laughs> you just smash it, man. Yeah, just, just if smash, smash it. it the, if you smash it enough, it'll just disappear. Yeah. Cause the um, it band, it's, it's so <laughs> pliable and easy to work with. Right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And that's the other thing is like people, uh, they don't respect like the actual tissue itself. The IT band is, is the coordination of three different muscles of the hip. You have the TFL, you have the glute medius, and you have the superficial part of the glute max. And then not only that, but you have the femoralis fascia that wraps around. So the IT band is like the central hub for your lower limb to coordinate with your pelvis. So to just, to just brutalize it, it doesn't make any sense, but it hurts a lot. So people love it. I guess. Yeah, right. But, um, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, okay. Yeah. For, for the hip. So mine is, uh, mine is actually, um, I think a former labrum tear and then maybe like a small, what's called like a, uh, FAI for more acetabular impingement. So it's like a small, maybe bony growth at the very front. Um, so for me, the thing that I need to do the most is I need to stretch the distal part of my psoas so that the part that attaches to the actual femur and crosses the hip. And then the proximal part of my rec fem that attaches to my hip, because those two muscles, they kind of overlap like this and, uh, they essentially form the front part of the hip, but mine are too tight. And like I was kind of saying earlier, they're stuck together, so mm. they don't move well within each other. And then the other problem is, is that there's a bursa there. So bursa is just like a little, uh, a little sponge of water. And the problem when you have tissue that's too tight is a lot of time you squeeze the water out of the bursa and it becomes calcified. So now I have like a little piece of calcified tissue in between the soft muscles. And so every time I flex my hip, it creates, creates pain. So for me, I have to do a lot of, uh, a lot, get a lot of blood flow into the area. So do a lot of little reps for, uh, for the distal part of the psoas. And then I have to do a lot, a lot of stretching. And then I do, um, the aldoa for the pubic symphysis and the aldoa for, um, the anteromedial part of the, the hip. So the hip, if you're looking down at your own leg, there's the part like where you're, uh, like where a, a gun would be, you know, you pull it out and just bang like that. And then there's the back part more close, more close to your glute. 
those two parts of the hip um, both each have aldoa. So I need to do the front part. So I'm curious, does each of those specific Eldo moves, do they have their own like unique name? Like I know L5S1, is it like named by the area that you're working? And I'm just curious. Yeah, yeah totally. So the spine is easy because it's just, uh, it's just the level of the spine that you're, that you're working on the mm-hmm. most. And the, the thing that I like about them is that it really is, it's all based on the anatomy. So mm-hmm. you have the anteromedial part, so the anterior, so the front middle part of the hip. So the answer medial and you have the poster lateral, um, you have any, any Eldo is, is, yeah, the thing I like about it is any Eldo is named after the place that it's targeting. So it's not like the, you know, the green, the green, uh, I don't know, bungee cord Eldo. It's just like, <laughs> all right, this is, <laughs> I'm trying to look around my house and see if I see something, but it's like, uh, you know, this is the Eldo for the place that we're trying to work on. All the anatomy is focused on this area. All of the intent is focused on this area based off of, you know, the assessment and and the the goal of the exercise. So your students get a little anatomy lesson along with uh, a little bit of better movement. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Well, I mean, so like the best, one of the best parts is, is like, if you have, you know, you have someone come in and, and uh, they have an injury, the, my personal slogan, if you will, my personal kind of tagline for my business is move more aware. And so the first, the first step in, in creating change in any in any system is to become one aware of what it is that you want to change. Right. So where am I? Where do I want to go? Okay, that's a, that's a good place to start. And so a lot of people come in like, oh, this spot on my back hurts. And so I teach them, all right, this is how you move your pelvis. Okay, this is where your pelvis is. This is the spot on your back that bothers you. This is L4, L5 or L5, S1. And uh, they learn some anatomy like because as – as important as it is, or as unimportant as it is, as someone who's maybe an accountant or a baseball coach to really, you know, know what L5S1 is, it gives them a little bit of power if they understand some of the things that are going on in their body, you know? So a lot of my clients, they do, they do learn some anatomy uh, during the sessions because I draw and say, okay, this is the ligament that we're working on. This is why it's important for you or, or whatever. Yeah, that's good. Uh, usually my first assessment with somebody, I'll, I'll do a little movement screening. Nothing as in depth as what you do, but I'll just have them take their shoes off and do a squat outside of their high heeled running shoe. And like, Oh my gosh, that's so much harder. Yeah. It's amazing. You actually <laughs> make your foot work like a foot and, uh, and it's yeah, you know, you work totally. all the little muscles in your feet and lower leg. And all of a sudden you can actually do a, a proper squat. It's pretty cool. But yeah, it's, yeah, it's cool to, it's cool to help people just sort of get that body awareness right away and, and help them understand that that's, that is a very important part. Like trying to teach somebody how to do a scapular retraction. Like I've had people where it can take a really long time and then you just all of a sudden a light bulb goes off, but that's yeah, learning how to pull. Yeah. That's the hardest one to teach. I think. Yeah, for sure. There's uh, I mean, I've definitely had times where I've been, and this is not a, a bad thing, but I've definitely had times where I've been working with people who you know, maybe they weren't athletes growing up or dancers. And so their level of body awareness is not so good. And there's definitely times, especially when I was uh, like first getting into this, because I kind of, you have the exercise that you know, you want them to do and you know how many steps it takes to get there, but you don't necessarily appreciate where someone might be on their journey for understanding their own body. So I was getting like frustrated with people. I was like, can you not like do the shoulder thing that I'm trying to get you to do? Like, can you not keep your head still? Because I'll be like, all right, raise your arm, but keep your head still. But no, no, put your head back. Oh, and then arm would go down, or like they'd move their leg, and I'm like, oh, stay play, like stay put. Um, yes. But but yeah, so I mean, it's uh, but that's part of the goal too, because even if you don't necessarily get them to be able to do the perfect exercise right away, you have to build a new map of their body in their brain, because a lot of people are, whether it be from the injury or from stress or from maybe just a, a background that wasn't very active. They don't have the base level of awareness to be able to do some complex exercise. So a lot of times people's first program is just general movement and awareness. Mm -hmm. Okay, I want you to pick up your left hip. I want you to bend just your right knee. I want you to push your headboard and backward. I want you to move your shoulder or whatever progression they're on. And then later, you know, two months maybe, then they do the exercise that, you know, you actually wanted them to do the very first session, you know. But I mean, that's. That's the, that's kind of the cool part about coaching is because you get to see, all right, this is where the person was. And now they're, you know, they're at a place where they can, they can do these things. So it's uh yeah, it's, it could be, it can be pretty cool. It can be frustrating sometimes, yeah. but it can be, it can be cool. Yeah. 
One of the cool things about Aldoa that I didn't realize until we talked today was the um, the the amount that it has to do with proprioception. Like you're talking about understanding where your limbs are in space. I didn't realize that the fascia had that much to do with it. So I would assume that, you know, having somebody creating the body awareness through the, you know, the Aldoas as you would step them through them would actually help accelerate their understanding of spatial awareness and proprioception, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, that's the proprioceptors lie in the fascia. And so, of okay. course, kind of like it's kind of like one of those things where it's like, all right, everything comes back to the fascia. I get it. But <laughs> no, I mean, it really does. Like that is that is the intelligent part about your body, obviously, other than your central nervous system, your brain, your spinal cord. Um, but it's really what coordinates your whole body and gives the feedback to everything. So the proprioceptors lie in the ligaments, which are a fascia. They lie in the periosteum, which is a fascia. They lie in the Golgi tendon organ, which is a fascia. Um, so that's where the intelligence of your body really comes from. And then obviously you have all of the, you know, the, um, enteroceptors in your, in your organs, but that is the intelligent part of your body. And so, um, whenever you get someone to change their map, the map of their, their body in their brain, um, you definitely open up a whole new way of thinking for them and a whole new way of moving. And like, for example, I have a lot of people that come to my classes who are, they come straight from their nine to five to my five thirty class. And they've been at a desk like this all day. You know, but they report to me, they're like, oh, I noticed that I'm sitting up taller at my chair without even trying. Or I noticed that as soon as my head goes forward, I bring it right back, you know, cool. because it looked cool. like this. Or it's like I noticed that like a guy told me literally yesterday I was driving and I looked over at the person in the car next to me and their head was so far forward. And I was like, oh, I'll put mine back in place. <laughs> so you just you, by repetition, by repetition of like, all right, put your head in a good place, put your head in a good place. No, change your by challenging their brain, not only physically to say, okay, push harder for the extension, but also, okay, where is your head? That's one of my favorite questions like in class is like, all right, where is your head? Because you don't say, put your head back. That gives them the answer. But you ask, okay, how is your gravity line? Where is it? Like, you know, you ask these questions that challenges uh, their own image in their brain. And that's what creates the, the change for them. Do you ever, I'm just curious. I had... <laughs> I was making some videos for uh, my online training app the other day and I was doing my stuff and I was watching it back and I was like, Oh man, this guy's got pretty good form. Okay. I can actually, I can put this out there. And then I saw myself yeah. shrugging my shoulders up on some delt raises and like, and then leaning my head forward. I'm like, good God, you know, I'm going to have to re yeah, yeah, do yeah. that. But to your point, it's like, it's, I mean, even guys like us that have pretty good body awareness, I think it's just something you have to do all the time. Like, Oh my gosh, I'm slouching in my chair again all right, engage the core. If I'm standing in line at the bank, all right, let's, let's turn those glutes on. Like you just have to do it all the time. It's just, I think the more you do it, the more you're aware, right? Totally. hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's one of those things where it's like you, in, in some way, the goal of exercise is to make the body capable of doing the thing without having to think about doing the thing. Right. Because if you, for example, like an athlete, if, if you had an athlete who's a sprinter and they were running the hundred meters, and when, my, when my right leg goes up, my left leg comes forward. Okay. Extend my ankle. Okay. Point my big toe. Okay. Keep my, like you would, it would take you 20 minutes to run the 100 meter dash. So the part of the goal of exercise is to make it automatic. And that's like the beautiful thing about exercise is that your body learns what to do as opposed to having like, I mean, if you wanted to hire me for 24 hours a day and say, okay, put your chin in place, be taller, like, <laughs> do all that kind of stuff. I guess you could, it'd be boring after a while, but that's the goal of exercise is to take you from a place where you are now and then move you slowly and slowly, slowly to a place where, where you want to be is just automatic. Right. And that is, that is your, that is your posture. Can I change your posture, which is just how you exist? Can I change that? It takes time, but yeah, I can change it through exercise because you learn how to do it. And through awareness, which is done through, you know, proper exercise. I'm curious um, because there's so many g good stories. If you look around and study Aldoa a little bit, there's some some really good success stories. I wasn't able to find any studies on Aldoa. Are there some out there that I just haven't been able to find? Is there? Do you know if Guy is is thinking about trying to do some studies on this? I'm just I'm a science guy and I just always like to back yeah, up sure. what I say with, with studies. Yeah, no, I, I don't have any, which is, uh, which is unfortunate a little bit, but, um, but, but no, because from my understanding, it's just been kind of one, it's been one of those things where he used it and got results from it. And so based off of the, the backing in anatomy and biomechanics, it kind of in some way, I guess in his mind validates itself. And then, 
he has thousands of people as practitioners using it and getting effects from it. And so unfortunately there are no like uh, placebo or uh, controlled studies, which I would love to see too. But as someone who uses it every day and, and uses it myself, like I'm a pretty, you, you can ask, you can ask my teacher, you can, I'm like a pretty linear guy, which means like, okay, give me the correct answer. Like there must be one way to do this. Um, so I would love to see those, but I've had to just kind of work with the fact that I feel that they work and that the people that I'm working with feel the effects from them. And so, uh, unfortunately there are none, but, uh, but I think that's kind of the way that he wants it in some, in some respect. Yeah. I mean, if people are loving it and they're having good results, it's pretty hard to argue with. I mean, it's, it's, I just, it would be nice to just be able to pull that and go. And on top of all of the good results we're seeing, here is this, this thing. I mean, you're, you're a science yeah. guy too. I know you can appreciate that, but yeah, hopefully absolutely. there'll it's, be somebody that comes along that, that'll actually just knock that out. I mean, part of it is it just takes a lot of time and it sounds like, you know, Givoy is just one of those that just wants to keep teaching and progressing on. It doesn't want to take time to, to maybe set aside that, time to do that. Yeah, I think that's I think that's his mo. I think that's his mo. He's uh, if you ever get the chance to meet him, you will you will find that he is uh, an extraordinary individual in in many ways. He's infuriating sometimes for a guy like me who's like, "Gee, you have to like you have to explain this to me. I don't <laughs> I don't I don't understand." I remember specifically. I'll tell you I'll tell you like a little story. So when I was in high school, this is how my brain worked. Uh, when I was in high school, I took Latin. And I was absolutely terrible at it. So bad, in fact, that I would have to memorize entire passages from the Iliad or the Odyssey so that if I saw the first word, I could write 300 words from memorization and just go. And that was like my translation. And so that's the way my brain worked. I was like, all right, if I'm going to get a good grade, then I need to be able to <laughs> I need to be able to memorize. I need to know the answer. I need to get A's on all the tests, all this kind of stuff. And uh, we were doing a biomechanics class, like a biomechanics part of the lecture in Eldo 4 last November. And we're going through all the exercises and he's explaining how one exercise works. And I'm, and I say to him, I'm like, gee, that's the exact opposite of what you said for another exercise. So you were like a equals B, but B does not equal a, it was, <laughs> it, was it was something like that where it just didn't linearly, like linearly make sense. And the thing that I didn't put together is that when you change the pelvis's orientation to gravity, you change the dynamics of the pelvis, right? So pelvis vertical versus pelvis prone is, is they're, they're two different biomechanics because of gravity. And so he's like, I understand that you're confused, but I need you to try to feel. And so that's like a part of the thing with the Aldoa is mm. you don't know where someone, you, you can't say someone's leg automatically goes 45 degrees of ABD. You can't say that because if they're ectomorphic or if they're more tight, maybe it doesn't go 45, maybe it goes 42 or 40 or whatever it is. That's where like the osteopathic part, being able to feel in your fingers when the person is in the right place is is like where the understanding comes from. And so his biggest thing is in a lot of the ways that he relies on different sciences to, to validate his, uh, his, his exercises. His big thing is you have to feel for yourself. You have to do for yourself. You have to feel for yourself. You have to experience for yourself. And through doing, which is exercise, you can learn and your body can understand something that maybe on paper it wouldn't have, uh, wouldn't have been totally clear. That, that's a really good point. I mean, um, you know, the best trainers are those of us that, you know, make sure we take care of our bodies first. And I don't know how many times I've been doing an exercise and go, Oh, I'm going to actually go right down that as a cue for my clients. Because, you know, whenever yeah. I, you know, squeeze my glutes at the top of this deadlift or whatever it is that, that little cue in my head was really helpful. And so I think that's a good point. If you, if you're feeling it yourself, you're actually a lot better at teaching it. Yeah, totally. And, and I mean, that's like, kind of the experience of, of life, right, is, is, is feeling it for yourself, is understanding it for yourself. You have a lot of people um, that I totally respect because without them, we wouldn't have even close to the information that we have, but they live in the papers mm -hmm. and they don't necessarily have any real world experience or, okay, it worked for the subjects in the paper, but what if you have someone that's different? You know, like that's, that might be the part of the problem with, with the study is you say, okay, how good is the practitioner that was teaching the Eldoa? How did they do the myofascial stretching before? Did they need the myofascial stretching before? Did they, you know, there's all, there's so many factors that go into a human, which is so unbelievably complex and, and, uh, and diverse that it's, I think, difficult to quantify in some respect with, with certain, uh, with certain metrics, like in, like in studies. So, 
I think that might be part of the reason. And part of the reason I think is he just doesn't care and loves to teach and wants to do whatever he wants to do. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, I think we've sparked the interest of people to to check out Aldo, at least to go out and Google it. But I think we've also done a good job of cautioning people to just go out and try any old thing they, they see on YouTube. So is, is Soma Finder still a good resource for folks to find a practitioner in their area or is there something else now? Uh, I, th- I would recommend that you would search, um, go to, uh, there's Eldoa.com, I believe. And then there's also uh, a website called, uh, legacy perform well.com and legacy perform well, I think has the most updated list of all of the Eldoa four practitioners in the world. I think there's like maybe 75 or 80 or 90, something like that in the world now. And wow. those are going to be the people that are the most, the most up to date on the education for the Eldoa. Uh, and then there's also a, if you go to Gee Boye's website, uh, you just have to search Gee Boye, maybe Soma training, something like that. There's a list of all the certified Soma trainers and Soma therapists and where they are. And those are people who have gone through the full, the full gamut of the curriculum. And uh, those are probably going to be your, those are going to be your highest level people along with the Eldoa trainers. Okay, great. Well, I'll list all of the resources you shared in the show notes and uh, blog cool. so people can check that out. Um, and then please share with everybody if, if they happen to be in Louisiana, what city are you in, in Louisiana? I'm in New Orleans, baby. New Orleans. Right. So if you're in the New Orleans area, you can just go hey. see one of the best of the best, go see Jacob. And, uh, yeah, right. so share your, <laughs> your website and, and your business name again for everybody. Yeah, sure. So my business is uh, shift training and health and, uh, I'm in New Orleans, Louisiana. And then my website is shift sport And, uh, it's getting, it's getting some revamped right now. So it'll be, it'll be looking brand new in a couple of weeks. Um, but yeah, so I have a lot of information on there about different ways that Aldo affects the body, different ways that the Soma training works for the body and, and the way athletes uh, and, and everyday people can use it for their, for their benefits. So I tried to make it a lot of information on there just so people can uh, learn as much as they can from it. And, uh, and, and yeah, so that's where, that's where all my stuff is. It's awesome, man. Yeah, definitely check it out, everyone. And one quick question just about Aldo, for folks that are thinking about adding it to their program. I know it's something sure. that you and Ben talked about too, you know, frequency, um, like how often to do them throughout the day. Do you have any tips on that? How long to hold each Eldo? I think 60 seconds was the rule at least a couple of years ago. And then, um, you know, again, best time of day to do it and, you know, pre-workout versus po- post-workout, that kind of stuff. How do you like to put that in people's programs? Yeah, sure. So if I have someone that's already active, like let's say they're already training or, you know, bike riding or whatever it is, I'll have them do the Aldoa at the end of that. So it's just kind of like their cool down their uh, We call it like regeneration, their recovery part of their program. If it's someone who's recovering from an injury and their entire program is let's get the pain to go away, then they'll do that whenever they would do their normal workout. So they'll do a little warm up that I teach them and then their full home program. And then if you have someone who's doing like a weightlifting session, then I would say always finish the weightlifting session, regardless of what it is that you do with L5 S1 on the wall. And then like church every single night I go to, uh, I go to L5 S1 before I go to bed. Awesome. It's a good, awesome. It's, yeah. It's a good, it's a good way to wind down too. I mean, you just kind of lay on the floor, put your legs on the wall and you just, you can chill for 30 seconds or you can chill for five minutes and then you do L5 S1 for one minute breathing all that. And, uh, and yeah, it's a, it's a good way to, to roll off into, into bed. Um, one thing, one thing real quick that I would recommend for people is that when they're going to do the Aldoa is to take your time. Not only it's one minute of effort, but I would say really take your time building into the tension. You don't want to go from zero to whoa, whoa, full tension. You want to take one piece at a time, build your awareness and make sure you kind of build your house brick by brick so that you get a good house at the end and not just a bunch of, of uh, owner unorganized pieces. Yeah, that's a good point. I think whenever I've had good success with L5 S1. It's just taking my time and slowly getting into the position. And I, I think the hardest thing for me is you've got a number of things that you're thinking about, all right, I'm pulling down here and I'm pushing up here and all that, but also to, <laughs> to breathe, like I'll have everything absolutely perfect. I'm like, but I'm not breathing. Yeah, but I'm not breathing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. It's, um, yeah, I mean that, that's the balance, right? That's the balance is you want to be able to work as hard as possible without working Mm. right so to be able to breathe while you're doing it is a really good sign that you're at least managing your intentions on 
staying relaxed enough to be able to create the space, but also working hard enough to actually make it an exercise. So it's that balance, but yes, always, <laughs> always breathe, always breathe for sure. And L5S1 particularly too, uh, try to make sure that your abs are totally relaxed. Oh, totally okay. Relaxed. So try to, try to let your belly be soft because if the abs are relaxed, then the lumbar spine, or sorry, if the abs are contracted, then one, you're probably holding your breath, but two, then the lumbar spine is going to be more secure, which means it's going to be less likely to open when you try to do the elbow. That's interesting. I, I would have to go do it to see if I do that, but I'm almost sure because I'm so used to having people engage their core and push their lower back into the ground whenever they're doing like a crunch or something. And then sure. also during that, if I'm not mistaken, you're tucking your chin down and I bet I'm almost certainly uh, engaging my abs. So I'll have to make sure I'm not doing that. That's a good tip. Yeah. I have sure, to man. do yeah, it. That's why, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that's why the Aldoa can be like, amazing because it, it, it coordinates 30,000 different pieces into this one exercise. But it's also why it can be really frustrating for people if they mm. try to go and go to the super advanced version too fast. Right. You know, like when I teach it to people, I say, typically I'll give them, I'll give them the full exercise with some modifications most of the time, but I'll give them one thing for the week that I really want them to focus on. Like, I'll just say, I really want you, regardless of everything else that you do, do your best with it. But I really want you to be as tall as possible. Right. And then, and then, and then when they come back, I'll say, okay, good. You mastered being tall. Now you can be tall and really work hard with your arms. All right. Now you have two things and then you add three, four, and before you know it, you have all of the pieces coordinated and you make a good exercise as opposed to just being like, well, I don't know what I'm doing. Right. Right. Yeah. That's good. It's like golf. It's yeah. like putting all the small pieces together. That's exactly, that is the exact analogy that I use is, is golf. Um, cause you're trying to golf is, uh, Golf is bullseye or golf is darts with the bullseye 500 yards away. Right. Right. So, uh, so when you're doing an Eldoa, you're trying to communicate with a very small piece of your body using the whole body. Right. So there's a lot of chatter going on that could get in the way of that communication. So you need to clear people out of the bar so you can talk to your friend. That takes, that takes time. Oh, so. I like that. That's a good way to put it actually. Well, dude, Person. thank you so Person. much for your time. I really appreciate it. Yeah, man. It's my pleasure. I'm glad to be able to share with you and I appreciate you uh, giving me the platform. So my, my pleasure. pleasure my... All right, everybody. So Eldoa.com, LegacyPerformWell.com, and of course, ShiftSportWellness.com. Check out Jacob. Yeah, that's right. Thank you all very much for watching the show today. Also, thank you to my special guest, Jacob Schoen, for joining the show and sharing his expertise. If you like this episode, please give it a like right down here. And also, please hit the subscribe button right up here. That way you can keep up with all the latest on Boost Health TV. Until next time, this is Paul Sandberg for Jacob Showing saying goodbye and find your balance.